Biofortification is one piece of the puzzle of addressing malnutrition. And we're a nutrition-specific intervention in that it's nutrition-specific agriculture. Uh, and we are one of the pieces to address uh, strategic development goal number two. And the ideal is that everyone has access to a nutritious, diverse diet. But because so many smallholder farmers cannot access the fruits and vegetables and animal protein that would make them healthy, biofortification is a bridge towards that goal. It is essentially taking the relatively unhealthy food that so many smallholder farmers subsist on, whether it's maize or rice or wheat or sweet potato or cassava, and naturally enriching it with micronutrients. So this slide, you'll say, how does biofortification work? What is biofortification? So it's improving nutrition by breathing into the seeds or vines or stems, depending on the plant, in, in, enriching them naturally with vitamin A or iron or zinc and other micronutrients. But we focus on the three that are most deficient ones that the World Health Organization has identified as the most important. And so we are a part of the CGIAR system. So what we do is, with our donor funding, we fund research. We have funded research for the past 10 or more years at different CG centers. So International Rice Research Institute, the Wheat and Maize, Potato Center, and other centers and have asked them to look through their libraries to find the varieties that are the most rich in vitamins and minerals. And then they are crossbred using conventional breeding with existing local varieties. We work with national agricultural research systems. What we can now say clearly that's proven is that you can do this without sacrificing yield. There's no trade-off in yield. We preserve all the other desirable traits, such as being resistant to drought or heat or diseases or pests. Farmers will adopt. This has been uh, really exciting to see. Farmers are willing to try these new crops. And now, to give one example, we have proven evidence that 30% of Rwandan farmers are growing high iron beans. We have done uh, detailed Im impact studies to prove this, and so that's a really encouraging example of adoption. We also can show that uh, farmers are um, willing to adopt it, uh, as I mentioned, through a variety of different channels. And the National Agricultural Research Services, once they test to show that it will grow in their different terrains or soils, or climates that they will, um, you know, work with us to, to disseminate. So the slide that we are now showing, for those who can see the slides, it's a little difficult to read, but it shows that around the world there are now more than 30 countries where biofortified staple food crops are available, and they're being tested in about 55 countries in total. So there's some overlap. There are some countries that already have the crops and are testing other varieties. And just in the eight countries where Harvest Plus has very intensive country programs, five countries in sub-Saharan Africa and three in South Asia, we can show just in those eight countries where we have very accurate abilities to monitor and evaluate. 15 million people are now growing and eating these healthier food crops, and it's scaling up rapidly. Uh, so, and also, even when these these fruits and excuse me, these crops are are a different color because of the adding the vitamin A. For example, at the beginning, I tried to show the ear of vitamin A maize that is orange, or the cassava turns yellow. Uh, or sweet potato turns a bright orange when you add the beta carotene, the vitamin A. Farmers are willing to grow those crops 
and families are willing to eat them because they've gotten the nutrition messaging. So it's, it's scaling up rapidly, and what we're really encouraged to see is countries are willing to invest their own funding. Donors are prioritizing this. The World Bank, for example, is now directly funding Uganda to scale up orange sweet potato. And this slide now shows also something Dr. Giroti was mentioned in his remarks. This is primarily to address rural poverty, the malnutrition that's prevalent among smallholder farmers. But you see in this slide, if you're able to see the slides, these are trucks, these are lorries that show uh, the branding for maize millers in Zambia. So there's both the farmers growing and eating at the local level, but now we have seed companies, local seed companies, but also processors who make the flour or the maize meal. And they are now selling to the urban consumers who can afford the biofortified vitamin A maize in meal or flour. So we're trying to address the whole value system, the whole food chain. For us to scale up, Harvest Plus has about 150 employees, most of them in the field. And we feel we've made good progress working with partners, but now to scale up to reach the hundreds of millions of people who need to access these healthier foods, we need to work with partners in the public sector, in the private sector where, where that's relevant, such as in maize, rice, or wheat, where there are seed companies. And with NGO implementing partners, we're going to hear from spring today, there are groups like World Vision, Mercy Corps, Catholic Relief Services, and others who are now adopting and promoting these on a wide scale through the farmer networks where they work. I mentioned the World Bank and other international financial institutions. The African Development Bank is very interested in nutrition-specific and nutrition-sensitive agriculture. So we're very excited about the progress that's being made. It's the result of many partners and of you know, generous donors visionary donors like so many of you on the call today. So that was very fast, but I appreciate the opportunity. Happy to take any quick questions. Thank you. I'm just wondering, um, for those prospect strains, um, the yield in terms of seed for planting the following year, if it's the same in terms of quantity as, you know, just using a local strain. So we, d we develop uh, the different Varieties will bring about 50 varieties originally to the National Agricultural Research Service for the two years of testing. And then, you know, on average, maybe 10 varieties that really work well. Uh, just to, you know, just for example, that's how it worked in Rwanda. So we do both hybrid and open pollinated varieties. So that's the kind that farmers can reuse and can share. Uh, for things like sweet potato or cassava, they can share the vines or the cuttings. So we have not seen any decrease in yield or in the ability to reuse or share. Um, but there are farmers, even low-income farmers, who like to buy hybrid seed because of the higher yield. So we, we also make that available. But basically, there's no difference in terms of the yield. In fact, some of the varieties are quite uh, even more higher yielding, and that was the case in Rwanda, so that helped with adoption. And they, they don't need more water, they don't need more fertilizer, they cost the same. So it's, it's quite sustainable and cost effective. Mm -hmm.